morning and good day wherever you are. Welcome to Biblical Quests. We are a worldwide scripture study community seeking to fulfill Yah's commandment to his followers to meditate on the Torah day and night so that we may be like a tree planted by streams of water that gives its fruit in its season. So all that we do will prosper. This is week 12 and 13 of our 52-week cycle of chronological reading through the Torah, Prophets, and Yeshua's words, reminding you that we are currently going through year one, which means that today the deep dive will be on the Torah portion in Genesis. The reading and open discussion will explore several sources, in particular the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Septuagint, and the Hebrew-English Masoretic. Where relevant, we will also explore extra-canonical books as found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. We are humbled and excited to share this journey with you all. Let us pray. Father Yah, we give thanks and praise to your great name. Father, may you bless this time that we are studying in your words, sharing what we have read, what we have studied, what we have researched, and may it be productive conversations, and may we gain additional wisdom of your words and your ways. Father, we pray that this is a blessing to all that hear or watch in the future and that it it is a blessing for them. Father, we look forward to all that you have to share with us. In Yeshua's name, amen. Amen. Okay, welcome everyone. A quick reminder that I dropped the PDF for tonight's study in the recordings channel. This is our master schedule, and as you can see, this week's portion includes chapters from last week and this week, 12 and week 13, as we skipped last week. So we are going to go through chap- six chapters from Genesis, and also we have Isaiah and Matthew for this two weeks portions, but the deep dive is going to be only on Genesis. So tonight we are going to cover chapter 42 through chapter 47 and then discuss the variant tickers. Okay, so let us begin chapter 42. This is Genesis chapter 42. When Jacob realized that there was grain in Egypt, Jacob said to his sons, Why do you look at one another? Then he said, Look, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy grain for us there that we may live and not die. And the ten brothers of Joseph went down to buy grain from Egypt. But Jacob did not send Benjamin, the brother of Joseph, with his brothers, for he feared harm would come to him. Then the sons of Israel went to buy grain amid those other people who went as well, for there was famine in the land of Canaan. Now Joseph was the governor over the land. He was the one who sold food to all the people of the land. And the brothers of Joseph came and bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. And Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them, but he pretended to be a stranger to them. And he spoke with them harshly and said to them, From where have you come? And they said, From the land of Canaan to buy food. And Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. And Joseph remembered the dreams which he had dreamed concerning them. And he said to them, You are spies. You have come to see the nakedness of the land. And they said to him, No, my lord, but your servants have come to buy food. We all are sons of one man. We are honest men. We, your servants, are not spies. Then he said to them, No, but you have come to see the nakedness of the land. Then they said, We, your servants, are twelve brothers, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. But behold, the youngest is with our father today, and one is no more. But Joseph said to them, It is what I said to you. You are spies. By this you shall be tested. By the life of Pharaoh you will not go out from here unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of you, and let him bring your brother. But you will be kept in prison, so that your words might be tested to see if there is truth with you. And if not, by the life of Pharaoh surely you are spies. Then he gathered them into the prison for three days. On the third day Joseph said to them, Do this and you will live, I fear God. If you are honest, let one of your brothers be kept in prison where you are now being kept. Let the rest of you go. Carry grain for the famine for your households. You must bring your youngest brother to me, and then your words will be confirmed, and you will not die. And they did so. Then each said to his brother, Surely we are guilty on account of our brother when we saw the anguish of his soul, and he pleaded for mercy to us, and we would not listen. 
Therefore this trouble has come to us. Then Reuben answered them, saying, Did I not say to you, Do not sin against the boy? But you did not listen, and now, behold, his blood has been sought. Now they did not know that Joseph understood, for the interpreter was between them. And he turned away from them and wept. Then he returned to them and spoke to them, and took Simon from them and tied him up in front of them. Then Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain and to return their money to each sack, and to give them provisions for the journey. Thus he did for them. Then they loaded their grain upon their donkeys and went away from there. And one of them later opened his sack to give fodder to his donkey at the lodging place and saw his money. Behold, it was in the mouth of the sack. And he said to his brothers, My money was returned, and moreover, behold, it is in my sack. Then their hearts failed them, and each of them trembled and said, What is this God has done to us? And when they came to Jacob their father in the land of Canaan, they told him everything that had happened to them, saying, The man, the lord of the land, spoke harshly to us and treated us as if we were spying out the land. But we said to him, We are honest, we are not spies. We are twelve brothers, the sons of our father. One is no more, and the youngest is with our father now in the land of Canaan. Then the man, the lord of the land, said to us, By this I will know that you are honest. Leave one of your brothers with me, and take food for the famine in your households, and go, and bring your youngest brother to me. Then I will know that you are not spies, but you are honest. I will give your brother back to you, and you will trade in the land. And it happened that when they emptied their sacks, behold, each one's pouch of money was in his sack. And when they and their father saw the pouches of their money, they were greatly distressed. And Jacob their father said to them, You have buried me, Joseph is no more, and Simon is no more, and Benjamin you would take. All of this is against me. Then Reuben said to his father, You may kill my two sons if I do not bring him back to you. Put him in my hand, and I myself will return him to you. But he said, My son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead, and he alone remains. If harm meets him on the journey that you would take, you would bring down my gray head and sorrow to Shaul. One of my thoughts was that he accused them of being spies, and I didn't see it here, maybe I missed it, but did not the sons of Jacob come into Egypt in different gates? No. Somewhere, okay, I must have read that somewhere else, that they came in different gates, and that's why Joseph was more or less accusing them of being spies, because why would they come in different gates? and they're all, to quote, together brothers. Okay, maybe I read it somewhere else. Okay. Or maybe it's a hypothesis someone shared. Yeah, there are many hypotheses, yeah. and I'm going to talk about some of them and share my oh. proposition on the whole story. Okay. So things are not necessarily as they seem. At the end of 22 years of separation, ups and downs, and unexpected twists, Joseph and his brothers finally meet. This is a traumatic encounter. The last time we saw them together, the brothers planned to kill Joseph and eventually sold him into slavery. One of the reasons for this was their anger at the stories of his dreams. Twice he dreamed that his brothers would bow to him. To them, these dreams symbolized bravado, ostentation, and arrogance. Ostentation is usually punished with a downfall, and this is what indeed happened to Joseph. His brothers turned him into a slave as opposed to the master he dreamed of being. But here in our case, unexpectedly, Joseph's dream comes true. His brothers bow down to him with their faces to the ground. Now, so it may seem, the end of the story has come. But it turns out that we are only at the, at the beginning of another completely different story. A story about sin, repentance, and forgiveness. In the meeting between Joseph and his brothers, only one person present, Joseph himself, knows that this is a meeting of renewed union. And Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. There are many reasons why they didn't recognize him. Many years have passed. They didn't even know he was in Egypt. They thought he was still a slave, while the man before them was second to the king of Egypt. But beyond this, Joseph looked Egyptian, spoke Egyptian, and had an Egyptian name. 
Most importantly, he wore high-ranking Egyptian clothes. This is the attire that Pharaoh clothed him with as a symbol of his elevation to greatness. In Genesis 40, 41, I think it's a typo, in Genesis 41, 41 through 45 then pharaoh said to joseph see i have set you over all the land of egypt then pharaoh removed his signet ring from his finger and put it on the finger of joseph and he clothed him with garments of fine linen and he put a chain of gold around his neck and he had him ride in his second chariot, and they cried out before him, Kneel! And Pharaoh set him over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, but without your consent, no one will lift his hand or his foot in all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called the name of Joseph, and gave him Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On, as a wife. And Joseph went out over the land of Egypt. From the ancient wall paintings discovered in Egypt, such as those in the tomb of Tut Anachamon, we know how stylish and ornate the attire of the rulers in Egypt was. People of different ranks wore different clothes. The early pharaohs had two headdresses, one white to signify that they were the kings of Upper Egypt and the other red to indicate their kingship over the Lower Egypt. Uniforms and clothing in general tell a story, or as we say today, make a statement. They announce a person's status, a man dressed in royal Egyptian garb whom the brothers bow down to surely cannot be their long-lost brother Joseph, but it was him. The matter of clothing may seem trivial to us, but digging deeper in the Torah it's clear it is not. Cloth turn out to be a very big deal in the Torah. First, we must remember that the Torah in general, and the book of Genesis in particular, has a special way of focusing our attention on an important theme. It introduces us to certain themes repeatedly. For example, the theme of sibling rivalry recurs in Genesis in four episodes, Cain and Abel, Isaac and Ishmael, Jacob and Esau, Joseph and his brothers. Three times the book repeats the theme of the father who is forced to leave his country because of famine and consequently ask his wife to introduce herself as his sister to avoid threats to his life. And there is also the theme of finding a future wife by the well, which repeats three times Rebecca, Rachel, and at the beginning of the book of Exodus, Zipporah, Jethro's daughter. The meeting between Joseph and his brothers also belongs to such a thematic series of episodes. The theme in this case is clothes. This story is the fifth in the series. The first is the story of Jacob wearing Esau's clothes and bringing his father a meal to receive his brother's blessing. The second is the story of Joseph's robe of many colors, which his brothers soak in blood and bring to their father. The third is the story of Tamar removing her widow's clothes, covering herself with a veil and pretending to be a prostitute. The fourth is the garment that Joseph leaves in the hands of Potiphar's wife when he flees from her. And here we have the fifth, in which Pharaoh dresses Joseph as a high-ranking Egyptian in garments of fine linen, gold ornaments, and a royal ring. In all five stories, a situation arises where things are not as they seem. Jacob wears Esau's clothes because he is afraid that his blind father will touch him and find out based on his smooth skin that he is Jacob and not Esau. Joseph's stained robe was meant to mask the brother's responsibility for his disappearing. 
Tamar's disguise as a prostitute was intended to make Judah sleep with her because she wanted a son that would seed her dead husband. Potiphar's wife used Joseph's garment that was left in her hand to prove that she allegedly attempted that he allegedly attempted rape. And finally, in the fifth story, Joseph took advantage of the fact that his brothers did not know him to stage a series of events that tested whether the brothers were still able to sell a brother to a slave or whether they had changed. All clothing stories in the Tanakh, and there are a few more, and I mentioned three more of them in 1 Samuel 28, 1 Kings 14, and 1 Kings 22. So all clothing stories in the Tanakh teach the same lesson. Things are not necessarily as they seem. Outward appearance is deceiving. This is hinted at by the double meaning of the root Beged. So Beged, if you look at it, it's exactly the same three letter Bet Gimel Dalet Beged. But the sound is different. So the same three letters, if you say Beged, it's garment or article of clothing. And if you change the sound and you say Bagad, it means to betray, cheat, and or deceive. So the same root gives you clothing, but also deception in Hebrew. That's very interesting. The thread that is interwoven through the clothing theme in the Tanakh is that clothing, especially foreign clothing or costume, and deception go hand in hand. A garment as clothing, a garment of betrayal. The literary researcher Eric Urbach pointed the difference between the literary style of the Homeric epics and the style of the Tanakh. Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, for example, is rife with colors and visual descriptions. The biblical story, on the other hand, has very few descriptions. We do not know if Abraham was tall or short, nor what the color of Miriam's hair was, nor what Moses looked like. The visual details are rare and are given only when they are essential to understanding what is happening. We are told, for example, that Joseph was well-built and handsome just so that we understand why Potiphar's wife desired or more like obsessed with him. The key to understanding the five stories is found later in the Tanakh in the stories of the first two kings of Israel. Saul had a majestic appearance. He was a young and handsome man. There was not a man from the Israelites more handsome than he was. From his shoulders up, he was taller than all the people. 1 Samuel 9.2 He was Tamir. He had presence, but he lacked confidence. He followed the people instead of leading them. Samuel had to reprimand him and remind him, even though you are small in your own eyes, are you not the head of the tribes of Israel? Saul had a physical stature, but not a moral stature. With David, the opposite is true. When Yah commanded Samuel to go to Jesse's house in Bethlehem and find there the future king of Israel, no one imagined that it was David, the youngest of the sons and the shortest among them. Samuel's first impulse was to anoint Eliav, who, like Saul, was tall and impressive in appearance. But Yah said to him, do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For God does not see what man sees. For a man looks on the outward appearance, but Yahweh looks on the heart. 1 Samuel 16, 7. Only after we have read all these stories, we can return to the story I have not yet mentioned, which is actually the very first of all the stories in which clothing plays a part. 
The story of Adam and Eve, who ate from the tree of knowledge, discovered that they were naked and were ashamed. Consequently, Yahweh God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin, and he clothed them. Genesis 3.21 We already discussed this story in week one of our deep dive series. The theme of this story is much clearer now. It is a story about eyes and ears, about sight and hearing. Adam and Eve's sin was not related to fruit or sex sexuality, as some like to think, but to the fact that they let the sight of their eyes push aside the sound of their ears. And Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. Why didn't they know him? Because from the very beginning, Joseph's brothers let their hearts follow the sight of their eyes and let the robe of many colors ignite their jealousy of their younger brother. They judged their situation based on an outward appearance and missed the truth hiding beneath it. The Tanakh teaches us time and again that appearance is deceiving, the clothes betray. In order to deeply understand Yah's will, it is impossible to rely solely on the sight of the eyes. In order to choose between good and evil, between truth and falsehood, in order to live a moral life, it is our duty to make sure that we do not just look, but also and especially listen. Deuteronomy 4.1 Now, Israel, listen to the rules and to the regulations that I am teaching you to do, in order that you may live and you may go in and you may take possession of the land that Yahweh, the God of your ancestor, is giving you. Deuteronomy 5.1 And then Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, Hear, Israel! the rules and the regulation that I am speaking in your ears today, and you shall learn them and you must observe them diligently. Deuteronomy 6.3 And you shall hear Israel and be careful to observe this instruction instructions so that it may go well for you and that you may multiply greatly just as Yahweh the God of your ancestors promised you in a land with milk and honey. Deuteronomy 6 4 Hear O Israel, Yahweh our God, Yahweh is one. Shema Israel, hear O Israel, is a fundamental commandment, and that is why traditionally Jews cover their eyes when they say these words, to focus their attention on hearing rather than being enticed by their eyes to stray away from Yah. Very nice. Thank you. Appearances are not what they seem, I think. You hit on some good scriptures in there, which is true. And many of us do that today. This is Genesis chapter 43. Now the famine in the land was severe, and it happened that as they finished eating the grain which they had brought from Egypt, their father said to them, Return and buy a little food for us. Then Judah said to him, The man solemnly admonished us, saying, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. If you will send our brother with us, we will go down and buy food for you. But if you will not send him, we will not go down. For the man said to us, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. But Israel said, Why did you bring trouble to me by telling the man you still had a brother? And they said, The man asked explicitly about us and about our family, saying, Is your father still alive? Do you have a brother? And we answered him according to these words. How could we know that he would say, Bring down your brother? Then Judah said to his father Israel, Send the boy with me, and let us arise and go, so that we will live and not die. You, we, and our children, I myself will be surety for him. You may seek him from my hand. If I do not bring him back to you and present him before you, then I will stand guilty before you forever. Surely if we had not hesitated by this time, we would have returned twice. Then their father Israel said to them, If it must be so, then do this. Take some of the best products of the land in your bags and take them down to the man as a gift, a little balm and honey, aromatic gum and myrrh. 
and pistachios and almonds, and take double the money with you. Take back with you the money that was returned in the mouth of your sacks. Perhaps it was a mistake. And take your brother. Now arise and return to the man. And may El Shaddai grant you compassion before the man that he may release your other brother to you and Benjamin. As for me, if I am bereaved, I am bereaved. So the men took this gift, and they took double money in their hands, and Benjamin, and they rose up and went down to Egypt and stood before Joseph. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the one who was over his household, Bring the men into the house and slaughter and prepare an animal, for the men shall eat with me at noon. And the man did as Joseph had said, and the man brought the men into the house of Joseph. And the men were afraid when they were brought into the house of Joseph. And they said we were brought here on account of the money that was returned to our sacks the first time, that he might attack us and fall upon us to take us as slaves with our donkeys. So they approached the man who was over Joseph's house and spoke to him at the doorway of the house. And they said, Please, my lord, we surely came down once before to buy food. But when we came to the place of lodging and we opened our sacks, then behold, each one's money was in the mouth of the sack, our money in its full weight, so we have returned with it in our hands. Now other money we have brought down in our hand to buy food. We do not know who put our money in our sacks. And he said, Peace to you, do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father must have given you a treasure in your sacks. Your money came to me. And he brought Simon out to them. Then the man brought the men into Joseph's house, and he gave them water and washed their feet, and gave fodder to their donkeys. Then they laid out the gift until Joseph came at noon, for they had heard that they were to eat food there. And when Joseph came into the house, they brought the gift that was in their hand into the house to him, and they bowed down before him to the ground. And he greeted them and said, Is your father the old man of whom you spoke? Is he still alive? And they said, Your servant our father is well. He is still alive. And they knelt and bowed down. Then he lifted up his eyes and saw Benjamin his brother, the son of his mother, and said, Is this your youngest brother of whom you told me? And he continued, God be gracious to you, my son. Then Joseph hurried away, being overcome with emotion toward his brother, and sought for a place to cry. Then he went into a room and wept there. Then he washed his face and went out, now controlling himself, and said, Serve the food. And they served him by himself, and them by themselves, and the Egyptians who were eating with him by themselves. For Egyptians could not dine with Hebrews, because that was a detestable thing to Egyptians. And they were seated before him from the first born according to his birthright, to the youngest according to his youth. And the men looked at one another amazed, and portions were served to them from his table. And the portion of Benjamin was five times greater than the portion of any of them. And they drank and became drunk with him. This is Genesis chapter 44. Then he commanded the one who was over his household, saying, Fill the sacks of the men with food as much as they are able to carry, and put each one's money in the mouth of his sack. And my cup, the cup of silver, you shall put into the mouth of the sack of the youngest, and the money for his grain. And he did according to the word of Joseph that he had commanded. When the morning light came, the men were sent away, they and their donkeys. They went out of the city, and had not gone far when Joseph said to the one who was over his house, Arise, pursue after the men, and overtake them. Then you shall say to them, Why have you repaid evil for good? Is this not that from which my master drinks? Now he himself certainly practices divination with it. You have done evil in what you have done. When he overtook them, he spoke these words to them. And they said to him, Why has my Lord spoken according to these words? Far be it from your servants to do such a thing. Behold, the money that we found in the mouth of our sacks we return to you from the land of Canaan. Now why would we steal silver or gold from the house of my Lord? Whoever is found with it from among your servants shall die. And moreover, we will become slaves to my Lord. Then he said, Now also according to your words, thus will it be. He who is found with it shall be my slave, but you shall be innocent. Then each man quickly brought down his sack to the ground, and each one opened his sack. And he searched, beginning with the oldest and finishing with the youngest. And the cup was found in the sack of Benjamin. Then they tore their clothes, and each one loaded his donkey, and they returned to the city. And Judah and his brothers came to the house of Joseph. Now he was still there. They fell before him to the ground. Then Joseph said to them, What is this deed that you have done? Did you not know that a man who is like me surely practices divination? And Judah said, What can we say to my Lord? What can we speak? Now how can we show ourselves innocent? God has found the guilt of your servants. Behold, we are slaves to my Lord, both we and also he in whose hand the cup was found. But he said, Far be it from me to do this. The man in whose hand the cup was found, he will become my slave. 
But as for you, go up in peace to your father. But Judah drew near to him and said, Please, my lord, let your servant speak a word in the ears of my lord, and let not your anger burn against your servant, for you are like Pharaoh himself. My lord had asked his servants, saying, Do you have a father or a brother? And we said to my lord, We have an aged father and a younger brother, the child of his old age, and his brother died, and he alone remains from his mother, and his father loves him. Then you said to your servants, Bring him down to me that I may set my eyes upon him. Then we said to my lord, The boy cannot leave his father. If he should leave his father, then he would die. Then you said to your servants, Unless your youngest brother comes down with you, you shall not again see my face. And it happened that we went up to your servant, my father, and told him the words of my lord. And when our father said, Go back, buy a little food for us, then we said, We cannot go down. If our youngest brother is with us, then we shall go down. For we will not be able to see the face of the man unless our youngest brother is with us. Then your servant, my father, said to us, You yourselves know that my wife bore two sons to me. One went out from me, and I said, Surely he must have been torn to pieces, and I have never seen him since. And if you take this one also from me, and he encounters harm, you will bring down my great head in sorrow to show. So now, when I come to your servant, my father, and the boy is not with us, now his life is bound up with his life. It shall happen that when he sees that the boy is gone, he will die, and your servants will bring down the gray head of your servant, our father, to Sheol with sorrow. For your servant is pledged as surety for the boy by my father, saying, If I do not bring him to you, then I shall be culpable to my father forever. So then, please let your servant remain in place of the boy as a slave to my lord, and let the boy go up with his brothers. For how can I go up to my father if the boy is not with me? I do not want to see the misery which will find my father. I just had a couple of comments spontaneous without doing the slides. So I just wanted to explain something. So if you noticed something interesting, they were talking about divination. So I just wanted to shed some light on this. So my understanding is that as they were sitting for lunch or dinner with, with Joseph, uh, they all had silver cups and Joseph had a specific cup that he pretended, in my opinion, he pretended to use it for divination, to guess things or to predict things. And the way he did it is, remember they were saying that they were seated from the oldest to the youngest. So I think that he used the... He knew, of course, who is the oldest and who is the youngest. And I think he used it in a way to cause the cup to look like it's a special cup that he is using for divination because it's known that in, in the Egyptian kingdom they use divination. Basically, he pretended to, to do div divination with the cup and guessed which is the oldest, which is the second, and so on. And they fell for it. And then when the cup was discovered in Benjamin Beg, then he said, you took my cup of divination, like this is a special cup, which reminded me of Rachel taking the trophim from her father. She stole them, mm. and those actually her father used them for divination. But I don't know, I thought it was like a brilliant twist. But the whole point was the Joseph was not doing divination, he was just fooling them and giving the cup a special, a special value to give a little bit more uh, weight to, to why he's so upset that the cup was taken from him. But uh, I will get a little bit more into what happened here in, when I summarize everything after uh, chapter 45. This is Genesis chapter 45. Then Joseph was not able to control himself before all who were standing by him. And he cried out, Make every man go out from me. So no one stood with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept loudly, so that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard it. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? And his brothers were unable to answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. So Joseph said to his brothers, Come near to me, please. And they drew near. And he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. 
So now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves that you sold me here. For God sent me as deliverance before you. For these two years the famine has been in the midst of the land. But there will be five more years where there is no plowing or harvest. And God sent me before you all to preserve for you a remnant in the land and to keep alive among you many survivors. So now you yourselves did not send me here, but God put me here as father to Pharaoh and as master of all his household and a ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me and do not delay. You shall settle in the land of Goshen so that you will be near me, you and your children and your grandchildren, and your flocks and your herds and all that you have. And I will provide for you there, because there are still five years of famine, lest you and your household and all that you have become destitute. Now behold, your eyes see, and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see, that it is I who am speaking to you. And you must tell my father of all my honor in Egypt and all that you have seen. Now hurry and bring my father here. Then he fell upon the neck of his brother Benjamin and wept. And Benjamin wept upon his neck. And he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. And afterward his brother spoke with him. Then the report was heard in the house of Pharaoh, saying, Joseph's brothers have come, and it pleased Pharaoh and his servants. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Say to your brothers, Do this, load your donkeys and go back to the land of Canaan, and take your father and your households and come to me, and I will give you the best of the land of Egypt and you shall eat the fat of the land. And you, Joseph, are commanded to say this, do this. Take wagons from the land of Egypt for your little ones and your wives, and bring your father and come. Do not worry about your possessions, for the best of all the land of Egypt is yours. And the sons of Israel did And Joseph gave them wagons at the word of Pharaoh, and gave them provisions for the journey. To each and to all of them he gave sets of clothing, but to Benjamin he gave 300 pieces of silver and five sets of clothing. And to his father he set as follows, Ten donkeys carrying the best of Egypt, and ten donkeys carrying grain and food and provisions for his father for the journey. Then he set his brothers away, and when they departed he said to them, Do not be agitated on the journey. So they went up from Egypt and came to the land of Canaan to Jacob their father. And they spoke to him, saying, Joseph is still alive, and he is ruler over all the land of Egypt. And his heart went numb, because he did not believe them. Then they told him all the words of Joseph that he had spoken to them. And when he saw the wagons that Joseph had set to carry him, then the spirit of Jacob their father revived. And Israel said, It is enough. Joseph my son is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. Thoughts and insight on chapter 45. I'm going to focus on verse 7. And God sent me before you all to preserve for you a remnant in the land and to keep alive among you many survivors. So the remnant and this word remnant it as we'll see means a few remaining a few people a few from the total and I got some verses here used as an example 2 Kings 19:31. For from Jerusalem a remnant shall go out, and survivors from Mount Zion, the zeal of Yahweh, will do this. Second Chronicles 34, 9. And they came to Hilkiah, the high priest, and gave the money that was brought for the house of God, which the Levites, the guardians of the threshold, had gathered from the hand of Manasseh, Ephraim, and from the whole remnant of Israel, and from all Judah and Benjamin and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Ezra 9, 15, Yahweh God of Israel, you are righteous, for we have been left this day as a remnant. Here we are before you in our guilt, for none can stand before you because of this. Isaiah 10, 20-22, And this shall happen on that day, the remnant of Israel and the survivors of the house of Jacob will not continue to lean on the one who struck it, but will lean on Yahweh, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. A remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God. For though your people, Israel, was like the sand of the sea, only a remnant of it will return. Annihilation is determined, overflowing with righteousness. Isaiah 11, 11, And this shall happen on that day. The Lord will again extend his hand a second time to acquire the remnant. Jeremiah 11, 21-23, 20, 
Therefore, thus says Yahweh concerning the people of Anathoth, who seek your life, saying, You shall not prophesy in the name of Yahweh, or you will die by our hand. Therefore, thus says Yahweh of hosts, Look, I am about to punish them. The young men will die by the sword. Their sons and their daughters will die by the famine. And a remnant will not be left for them. For I will bring disaster to the people of Anathoth, the year of their punishment. So this word being used for remnant is a few of the many. And we'll dig into this further with the cycle. The term remnant is being used many times and there's a cycle to it. The remnant cycle continues in scripture. There is a remnant that multiplies, producing good fruit and eventually bad fruit. Those are the ones that succumb to the temptations of the world. Then judgment comes upon them all and a remnant of good survives and continues this cycle. We see this over and over in scriptures that there is a remnant grows. And then from that remnant in the growth, there are many that end up succumbing to the temptations of the world and becoming evil, etc. And then another remnant is culled from that. In Sirach 47, 22, But the Lord will never leave off his mercy, neither shall any of his works perish, neither will he abolish the posterity of his elect, and the seed of him that loveth him he will not take away. Wherefore he gave a remnant unto Jacob, and out of him a root unto David. And I just wanted to highlight the seed of him that loveth him, he will not take away. So the remnant is obviously those who would love him. In Romans 9, 25 to 29, as he also says in Hosea, and this is the writer of Romans quoting Hosea, I will call those who were not my people and those who were not loved. And it will be in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people. There they will be called sons of the living God. And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, even if the number of the sons of Israel is like the sand of the sea, the remnant will be saved. For the Lord will execute his sentence thoroughly and decisively upon the earth. And just as Isaiah foretold, if the Lord of hosts had not left us descendants, we would have become like Sodom and would have resembled Gomorrah. Romans 11, 2 through 8. God has not rejected his people, whom he foreknew. Or do you not know in Elijah what the scripture says, how he appeals to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets, they have torn down your altars, and I alone am left, and they are seeking my life. But what does the divine response say to him? I have left for myself 7,000 people who have not bent the knee to Baal. So in this way also, at the present time, there is a remnant selected by grace, but if by grace, no longer by works, for otherwise grace would no longer be grace. What then? What Israel was searching for, this it did not obtain, but the elect obtained. And the rest were hardened, just as it was written. God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that do not see and ears that do not hear until this very day. Grace would not be grace if we were not to do works. But grace is given to those who walk in obedience and hearts are sincere in love with the Father and our neighbor. That is what is key with grace. First Peter 1, 16 to 25, For it is written, You will be holy because I am holy. And if you call on him as Father who judges impartially according to each one's work, conduct yourselves with fear during the time of your temporary residence, because you know that you were redeemed from the futile way of life inherited by your ancestors not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of an unblemished and spotless lamb who was foreknown before the foundations of the world, but has been 
revealed in these last times for you, whom through him are believing in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for sincere brotherly love, love one another fervently from the heart because you have been born again, not from perishable seed, but imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of the grass withers and the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that has been proclaimed to you. So I wanted to point out clearly states talking about remnant that it's those who have purified their souls by the obedience to the truth for the sincere brotherly love and loving one another fervently from the heart. These are those who have been born again. This is the remnant that is very few. And when we looked at the 7,000 who did not bend their knee to Baal, when you look at 7,000 compared to the number of people there, the it's less than 1%. It's le less than 1% that, w that was the remnant. So, how many? Regarding verse 7 with this remnant. Let's read in Genesis 46, 26 to 27. All the persons belonging to Jacob who came to Egypt, who were his descendants, not including the wives of the sons of Jacob, were 66 persons in all. And the sons of Joseph, who were born to him in Egypt, were two persons. All the persons of the house of Jacob who came to Egypt were 70. And we see this also in Exodus 1.5 and Deuteronomy 10.22. They all say 70 that were in the house of Jacob that came to Egypt. So we have 66. This number would be Jacob's sons and their children only. It did not include their wives, nor Jacob and his wives. So if you add Jacob, Leah, Zilpah, and Bilhah, then you will get 70. This is still no sons, wives included. Or if you add Jacob, Joseph, Manasseh, and Ephraim, you get 70. And that's no wives at all included in this number. You can still get the number 70 in different ways there. But if we read the Septuagint, Genesis 46, 26 to 27, it says on verse 27, And the sons of Joseph who were born to him in the land of Egypt were nine souls. All the souls of the house of Jacob who came, to, came with Joseph into Egypt were 75 souls. So here the Septuagint is saying it's 75 and not 70. If you add Jacob, Leah, Zilpah, and Bilhah, then you get 70. And this is no sons' wives because it mentions no, not including the wives of the sons. The other five could be Manasseh, Ephraim, Jochebed, which is the daughter born of Levi in Egypt, and that's mentioned in Numbers 26-59, Ur, who died in Canaan, and Onan, who died in Canaan, then you would get 75, and that's no sons, wives included. So there's different ways you can add this up. They both can be correct depending on how you want to add it up in that sense. But I will state that in Acts 7-14, Joseph sent and summoned his father Jacob and all his relatives, 75 persons in all. So the writer of Acts is referencing the Septuagint from his writings. So if you were to have 70 or 75, and that is a remnant amongst the land of Egypt, and at that time the estimation of Egyptians, from what at least online says, could be around 2 million people, that would equate to less than one fraction of a percent, a fraction of a fraction. So it's very small. And each and every time that I've come across the remnant and there was a number given, such as the 7,000 who didn't bow their knee, here the 70 or 75, when you compare those numbers to the total number of the peoples in that area that's being referred to, it's minuscule. It's, it's minuscule. I think the best percentage I've seen whenever I've noticed this was maybe 3%. And then the worst being this one here, 0.004%. So anywhere in that range, that just gives you an idea when Yah talks about a remnant. It's very small. Yeah, very, well, very I small. mean, Noah and his family were the remnant, and that was 
less than even this. Yeah, oh, that's... that's the entire world was... Yeah, demolished. the entire world, that would be yeah. many zeros of a percentage. Yeah. yeah, so basically the lesson is the remnant, even the upcoming remnant, is going to be very small. It is going to be very small, and that's why I wanted to point out some of the qualifiers mm -hmm. of the remnant, so people understand that it's about obedience to the truth and sincere love like sincere love for others and for God. And that's what will determine them being a remnant. Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay, so I wanted to summarize my thoughts about Joseph's reunion with his brothers. Reading the story of the reunion <clears throat> of Joseph and his brothers in Egypt, from the moment the brothers go down to Egypt and meet the deputy to the king of Egypt, until he reveals himself to them as Joseph, raises several questions. The first question is how to understand the entirety of Joseph's action from the moment he meets his brothers to the moment he reveals himself to them. The second question concerns the role and meaning of Joseph's dreams in this context, and especially the fact that Joseph remembered them as soon as he saw his brothers. So the first, my first question is, was Joseph putting his brothers to the test? So I'm trying to understand the entirety of the story and why did Joseph act the way he acted. And I looked around and I found several hypotheses. So the first one, which is held by many rabbis, is that Joseph was putting his brothers to the test. So I ask myself that question and I write again the whole story and my humble op opinion is that he was not putting his brothers to the test. So the classical interpretation claims that Joseph's motive was to put the brothers to the test, to see how they would behave when their youngest brother was in danger. However, it seems that this interpretation does not fit the scriptures. If Joseph's intention was to put his brothers to the test, to see how they would behave when their little brother was in danger, he would have gotten his answer prior to Judah's speech. His brother's reaction to his attempt to detain Benjamin without a doubt indicates they stood the test. They passed the test. They did not abandon Benjamin, but returned with him to Egypt and asked to be slaves with him. They did this even though they had every reason to believe that Benjamin had indeed stolen the cup. And here, even though the brothers stood the test, Joseph did not reveal himself to them at that moment. On the contrary, he rejected their offer to be slaves together with Benjamin and freed them to ascend to their father in peace. Only after Judah's unexpected speech did a seemingly unplanned change took place in Joseph's behavior and he was not able to control himself and revealed himself to his brothers. The second hypothesis says that Joseph was acting out of a desire for revenge. Here again, I'm not in agreement. Another possibility is that Joseph attempted to take revenge on his brothers for selling him into slavery. Although this is a reasonable possibility based on one of the most primal human instincts, it does not fit with the character of Joseph as it is presented to us in the Torah, nor with some of Joseph's actions toward his brothers. With the exception of Joseph's negative behavior toward his brothers when he brought their evil slander to their father when he was a little boy, Joseph is consistently described in the Torah as a positive character, a God-fearing man who refrained from doing any evil, as for example when he refused to commit adultery with Potiphar's wife. 
Even in relation to his brothers in Egypt, Joseph is revealed as a positive character who shows great empathy and sensitivity. For example, when he hears the brothers regret of selling him, he turns away from them and weeps. Moreover, on two different occasions, Joseph commanded to fill his brother's bags with grain as much as they can and to return their money to them. There is no doubt that the return of the money scared the brothers, but it does not seem that this was Joseph's goal. If his goal was to sow fear among his brothers, he could have used much more effective means for this purpose, for example, serious accusations, imprisonment, and the like. From these actions of Joseph's, it seems that at the same time as carrying out his main plan, Joseph continued to make sure that his family had enough food as well as money and did not act out of a desire for revenge. Following the chain of events in response to finding the cup in Benjamin's possession, the brothers suggested to Joseph that they should all be his slaves. If Joseph was seeking revenge, this would have been the perfect scenario. He could have thrown his brothers into the pit, into the prison house, just as they did to him in the land of Canaan. Instead, he freed them to ascend to their father for peace. Another piece of evidence that refutes the claim that Joseph was motivated by a desire for revenge is found near the end of Genesis. After Jacob's death, the brothers feared that Joseph would now avenge them for their sin, and they turned to him as it were in the name of their father Jacob and asking, asked him to forgive them. Genesis 50, 15 through 20. And when the brothers of Joseph saw that their father was dead, they said, It may be that Joseph will hold a grudge against us and pay us back dearly for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent word to Joseph, saying, Your father commanded us before his death, saying, Thus you must say to Joseph, Oh, Please now forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin, for they did evil to you. So now, please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers went also and fell before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. Then Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you planned evil against me, but God planned it for good in order to do this, to keep many people alive, as it is today. So then, do not be afraid. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. And he consoled them and spoke kindly to them. Joseph responded to his brother's appeal by weeping. Although he did not make any concessions to his brothers, he did not diminish the severity of their actions against him. He added that Yah had other plans. The brothers were indeed afraid of Joseph and realized that they deserved him taking revenge on them. But this concern only stemmed from the way in which they perceived Joseph, which reveals more about them than about him. Contrary to their misconception, the Torah testifies to Joseph that he did not think about revenge at all. The very realization that he was suspected of this made him weep. And so it seems that according to the Torah, Joseph did not act out of a desire for revenge. So now I would like to propose my, <laughs> my way of looking at the series of uh, events here. So my question is, was Joseph attempting to sever all ties with his family? Joseph's moment of revelation to his brother seems spontaneous and not planned. Judah's speech surprised him because he could not imagine that Judah would approach and try to convince him to release Benjamin after all the possible arguments regarding the theft of the cup had already been made. This is what Judah said to Joseph. Genesis 44:16. And Judah said, What can we say to my Lord? What can we speak? 
Now, how can we show ourselves innocent? God has found the guilt of your servants. Behold, we are slaves to my Lord, but we and also he in whose hand the cup was found. And it is true that if Judah had not approached Joseph at the last moment, the brothers would have returned to their father in the land of Canaan without Benjamin. Judah's speech stirred something in Joseph's soul, which Joseph did not anticipate and couldn't plan for. Genesis 45.1 Then Joseph was not able to control himself before all who were standing by him, and he cried out, Make every man go out from me. So no one stood with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. If so, what was Joseph's original plan and what caused the change in this plan? If we read the story carefully from end to beginning, we can understand what motivated Joseph and what his plan was. As I showed above, Joseph did not try to avenge his brothers or punish them, nor did he put them to the test. What Joseph strived for was to maintain the separation from his family and take advantage of the opportunity that came his way in order to be reunited with his brother Benjamin. It was the act of sale that made it clear to Joseph that his brothers rejected him from the family and that he must come to terms with being separated from his father's house. <clears throat> he understood and accepted the extent and depth of the chasm between his brothers and him many years before the unexpected meeting with his brothers. The name he gave to his eldest son seals this understanding for us. Genesis 41:51, and Joseph called the name of the firstborn Menashe. For he said, God has caused me to forget all my hardship and all my father's house. Joseph's initial reaction to the surprising meeting with his brothers was his alienation from them. He was not interested in reuniting with the brothers who rejected him and therefore did not want them to recognize him. He also noticed that his brother Benjamin was not among the brothers coming to Egypt, and then the question arose in his mind as to whether he would ever get to be reunited with his younger brother and what he must do to achieve this. Joseph assumed that Benjamin was not independent, but under the control of the brothers. Therefore, an attempt to send a messenger to the land of Canaan to bring Benjamin would not have gone well, because obviously the family would have prevented Benjamin from going down to Egypt. Joseph recognized that the key was with the brothers and with their help he could bring Benjamin to him. Therefore, he detained them and accused them of spying. He did this in order to make the brothers bring Benjamin to him to prove their innocence. However, bringing Benjamin to Egypt was not enough. In order to get Benjamin to stay with him in Egypt, he had to stage the story of the theft of the cup seemingly detain him, and then send the rest of the brothers to the land of Canaan in the hope of never seeing them again. I hope you realize I'm doing a detective story like here. <laughs> okay, but why did Joseph need the cup plot? Couldn't he, by virtue of his authority and power, drive the brothers out of Egypt and leave Benjamin with him without accusing him of stealing the cup? The answer is that although the rulers in biblical times had a superior status, their kingdoms also had laws and they could not do as they pleased. An example of this can be seen in the story of the Naboth vineyard in 1st King chapter 21. The Jezreelite had a vineyard next to the estate of King Ahab. Ahab was interested in the vineyard and approached Naboth with a request to buy it, but Naboth refused to sell his ancestral property. Even though Ahab was the king of Israel, he could not take Naboth's vineyard without a reason. 
in order to get the vineyard, Queen Jezebel recruited false witnesses who testified against Naboth that he cursed the king. Naboth was found guilty, executed, and his property confiscated by the king. Only through a staged trial was Ahab able to win the vineyard of Naboth. In a story that became famous because Elijah's rebuke to Ahab, have you committed murder and also taken possession? 1 King 21.19 As in the story of Naboth vineyard, also in the case of Joseph and Benjamin, Joseph needed a legal excuse to keep Benjamin with him. However, the legality of the move was not enough. Joseph knew that without a credible excuse, the brothers would continue to make efforts to bring Benjamin back. Only if the brothers were convinced that Benjamin was caught in his depravity and it was fitting for him to be a slave, would they accept the severity of the decree and be forced to leave Benjamin in Egypt and return to the land of Canaan without him. But it is still not understood why Joseph commanded to fill his brother's bags with grain and return their money. It seems that he did this to show the brothers that he was not looking for a pretext against them. Even though he had the opportunity, he was not interested in their money. All he wanted is to return the stolen silver cup. The cup was found by Joseph's servant in Benjamin's bag at the end of a search that was carried out in a matter-of-fact manner, from the oldest to the youngest, most convincing. And so, we have seen that Joseph had a plan drawn up in detail on how to keep his brother Benjamin in Egypt and get rid of his other brother, brothers forever. What made Joseph then change his plan of separating himself from his family? Why did he finally decide to reveal himself to his brothers? During the meetings of the brothers in Egypt, Joseph went through a process of getting closer to his brothers and his family. He identified more and more with the brothers and began to feel empathy towards them. He was moved to see that his brothers recognized their sin and regretted selling him. And yet, at that stage, Joseph was still able to hold back, control his emotions, and stick to his original plan. The Torah tells us that Joseph inquired about Jacob's well-being numerous times. This indicates Joseph's longing for his father. However, from his personal experience and also family history, the pattern of his brother setting the tone in the family while Jacob stays passive was very clear. If you remember, <laughs> there, we read so many stories of where the brother really set the tone and Jacob just it was either quiet or just said something but never did anything about it. Therefore, despite his love for his father and his father's love for him, he had no choice but to accept being separated from his father's house. Joseph realized that despite his longing for his father, there was no point in trying to contact the family and that he should start a new life in the land of Egypt as he did with great success. Joseph's longing reached their peak during the meal with his brothers, where they stayed together for a moment like they used to in the land of Canaan and even drank together. But even though wine went in, no secret came out, and Joseph stuck to his plan. All this until Judah's speech, which constituted the proverbial straw that broke the camel's back. The speech was built for applause. There was probably not a dry eye left in the room where it was spoken. The main theme of his speech was Jacob's suffering and the devastating impact losing another son would have on him, a point that probably made a great impression on Joseph. Were any of the points in Judah's speech mentioned earlier during the brothers' conversations with Joseph? 
In the previous passages, the brothers mentioned their father in the land of Canaan. However, surprisingly, in all the conversations between the brothers and Joseph that preceded Judah's speech, Jacob's suffering was not mentioned at all. If during the meetings with the brothers in Egypt, Joseph understood from his brothers' internal conversations that they regretted the sale, that during the sale not all the brothers wanted to hurt him, and that Reuben even demanded that they not hurt him, from Judah's speech he learned that his father's influence on his brothers was greater than he had estimated. During the speech, Joseph realized that the brothers delayed going back to Egypt because his father opposed Benjamin's descent, and only Judah's personal guarantee convinced him to send Benjamin with them. These insights suddenly came together, and he realized that the union with the family, which previously seemed impossible to him, is indeed possible. Judah concluded his speech by taking personal responsibility. He guaranteed the boy's safety to his father, and so he volunteered to replace Benjamin and sit under Joseph as a slave. Judah's taking responsibility must have touched Joseph's heart and awakened in him the thought that he too must take responsibility and realize his destiny. Joseph could not hold back any longer. Everything became clear. He realized what he already understood in the first meeting with the brothers in Egypt, that the dreams he dreamed marked his destiny. The dreams assigned him a leadership position, not in the kingdom of Egypt, but rather in his own family. Despite all of Joseph's attempts to escape from the role assigned to him and disconnect from his family, Yah directed things in a different way. Joseph understood this, accepted the role, and decided to get to know his brothers. Genesis 45, 1-8 then Joseph was not able to control himself before all who were standing by him. And he cried out, Make every man go out from me. So no one stood with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept loudly, so that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard it. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? And his brothers were unable to answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. So Joseph said to his brothers, Come near to me, please. And they drew near. And he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. So now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves that you sold me here. For God sent me as deliverance before you. For these two years the famine has been in the midst of the lands, but there will be five more years where there is no plowing or harvest. And God sent me before you all to preserve for you a remnant in the land and to keep alive among you many survivors. So now you yourselves did not send me here, but God put me here as father to Pharaoh and as master of all his household and a ruler over all the land of Egypt. I love the detective work you did there. <laughs> yeah, I, I literally <clears throat> felt like Agatha Christie yeah. right at the end of her book, you know, how everything comes together. But that's how I, that's my impression. That's what happened. I wasn't convinced about the other I, hypotheses, but that makes more sense to me when I pieced everything together from end to beginning. Yeah, anyway. I totally get what you were saying yeah. there. Made sense. This is Genesis chapter 46. So Israel journeyed with all that he had, and he came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices to the God of his father, Isaac. And God spoke to Israel in visions of the night and said, Jacob, and he said, Here I am. Then he said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make you a great nation there. I myself will go down with you to Egypt, and I myself will also bring you up. 
and Joseph will place his hand over your eyes. So Jacob arose from Beersheba, and the sons of Israel carried their father Jacob, and their little ones, and their wives in the wagons Pharaoh had set to transport him. And they took their livestock and their possessions that they had acquired in the land of Canaan, and they came to Egypt, Jacob and all his offspring with him, his sons and his sons' sons with him, his daughters and his sons' daughters, and all his offspring he brought with him into Egypt. Now these are the names of the sons of Israel who came into Egypt, Jacob and his sons, Reuben, the firstborn of Jacob, and the sons of Reuben, Enoch, Palu, Hezron, and Carmi, the sons of Simon, Jemuel, Jamin, Ohad, Jachin, Zohar, and Shaul, the son of a Canaanite woman, the sons of Levi, Jershon, Kohath, and Morari, the sons of Judah, Ur, er, Onan, Shelah, Perez, and Zerah, but Ur and Onan died in the land of Canaan. And the sons of Perez were Hezron and Hamel, the sons of Issachar, Tala, Puva, Ayab, and Shimran, the sons of Zebulun, Sert, Elan, and Jalil. These are the sons of Lee that she bore to Jacob in Paddan Aram, and Dinah his daughter. His sons and his daughters were thirty-three persons in all. The sons of Gad, Ziphion, Hagi, Shuni, Esben, Iri, Arodi, and Arali, the sons of Asher, and Na, Ishva, Ishvi, and Bariah, and their sister Sarah, and the sons of Bariah, Heber, and Malkiel. These are the sons of Zilpah, whom Laban gave to Lee his daughter, and she bore these to Jacob, sixteen persons. The sons of Rachel, Jacob's wife, Joseph, and Benjamin, and Manasseh, and Ephraim, whom Asenet, daughter of Potiphar, priest of On, bore to him, were born to Joseph in the land of Egypt. The sons of Benjamin, Bela, Bikur, Ashbel, Jira, Naman, Ahai, Rosh, Muppin, Huppin, and Ard. These are the sons of Rachel who were born to Jacob, fourteen persons in all. The sons of Dan, Hushim, the sons of Naphtali, Jaziel, Guni, Jezer, and Shilam. These are the sons of Bilhah whom Laban gave to Rachel his daughter, and she bore these to Jacob, seven persons in all. All the persons belonging to Jacob who came to Egypt who were his descendants, not including the wives of the sons of Jacob, were sixty-six persons in all. And the sons of Joseph who were born to him in Egypt were two persons. All the persons of the house of Jacob who came to Egypt were seventy. He had sent Judah ahead of him to Joseph to appear before him in Goshen. And they came to the land of Goshen. Then Joseph harnessed his chariot and went up to meet Israel his father in Goshen. He presented himself to him and fell upon his neck and wept upon his neck a long time. Then Israel said to Joseph, Now let me die since I have seen your face, for you are still alive. Then Joseph said to his brothers and to his father's household, I will go up and report to Pharaoh, and I will say to him, My brothers and my father's household who are in the land of Cana have come to me, and the men are shepherds, for they are men of livestock, and they have brought their flocks and their cattle and all that they have. And it shall be that when Pharaoh calls you, he will say, What is your occupation? Then you must say, Your servants are men of livestock from our childhood until now, both we and also our ancestors, so that you may dwell in the land of Goshen, for every shepherd is a detestable thing to Egyptians. So I guess Egyptians detest Hebrews and shepherds. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> okay, continuing. Chapter 47. Genesis chapter 47. So Joseph went and reported to Pharaoh, and he said, My father and my brothers, with their flocks and their herds, and all that they have come from the land of Canaan, now they are here in the land of Goshen. And from among his brothers he took five men and presented them before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to his brothers, What is your occupation? And they said to Pharaoh, Your servants are shepherds, both we and also our ancestors. And they said to Pharaoh, We have come to sojourn in the land, for there is no pasture for your servants' flocks, for the famine is severe in the land of Canaan. So now, please let your servants dwell in the land of Goshen. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Your father and your brothers have come to you. The land of Egypt is before you. Settle your father and your brothers in the best of the land. Let them live in the land of Goshen. And if you know there are among them men of ability, then appoint them overseers of my own livestock. Then Joseph brought his father Jacob and presented him before Pharaoh. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh. Then Pharaoh said to Jacob, How old are you? And Jacob said to Pharaoh, The days of the years of my sojourning are one hundred and thirty years. Few and hard have been the days of the years of my life, and they have not reached the days of the years of the lives of my ancestors in the days of their sojourning. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh, and he went out from the presence of Pharaoh. And Joseph settled his father and his brothers, and he gave them property in the land of Egypt and the best part of the land, in the land of Ramesses. 
as Pharaoh had instructed. And Joseph provided his father and his brothers and all the household of his father with food, according to the number of their children. Now there was no food in all the land, for the famine was very severe, and the land of Egypt languished with the land of Canaan on account of the famine. And Joseph collected all the money found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan in exchange for the grain that they were buying. And Joseph brought the money into the house of Pharaoh. And when the money was spent in the land of Egypt and from the land of Canaan, all of Egypt came to Joseph, saying, Give us food. Why should we die before you? For the money is used up. And Joseph said, Give your livestock, and I will give you food in exchange for your livestock if your money is used up. So they brought their herds to Joseph, and Joseph gave food to them in exchange for horses, their flocks, and their cattle and donkeys. And he provided them with food in exchange for all their livestock that year. When that year ended, they came to him in the following year and said to him, We cannot hide from my Lord that our money and livestock belong to my Lord. Nothing remains before my Lord except our bodies and our land. Why should we die in front of you, both we and our land? Buy us and our land in exchange for food, then we and our land will be servants to Pharaoh. Then give us seed, and we shall live and not die, and the land will not become desolate. So Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh, for each Egyptian sold his field, for the famine was severe upon them, and the land became Pharaoh's. As for the people, he transferred them to the cities, from one end of the territory of Egypt to the other. Only the land of the priests he did not buy, for there was an allotment for the priests from Pharaoh, and they lived on the allotment that Pharaoh gave to them. Therefore they did not sell their land. And Joseph said to the people, Look, I have bought you and your land this day for Pharaoh. Here is seed for you so you can sow the land. And it shall happen that at the harvest you must give a fifth to Pharaoh, and four fifths shall be yours, as seed for the field and for your food and for those who are in your households, and as food for your little ones. And they said, You have saved our lives. If we have found favor in the eyes of my Lord, we will be servants to Pharaoh. So Joseph made it a statute unto this day concerning the land of Egypt, one-fifth to Pharaoh. Only the land of the priests alone did not belong to Pharaoh. So Israel settled in the land of Egypt, in the land of Goshen, and they acquired possessions in it and were fruitful and multiplied greatly. And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt seventeen years. And the days of Jacob, the years of his life, were one hundred and forty-seven years. When the time of Israel's death drew near, he called to his son, to Joseph. And he said to him, If I have found favor in your eyes, please put your hand under my thigh, that you might vow to deal kindly and faithfully with me. Please do not bury me in Egypt, but let me lie with my ancestors, carry me out of Egypt, and bury me in their burial site. And he said, I will do according to your word. Then he said, Swear to me. And he swore to him. Then Israel bowed himself on the head of the bed. Okay, so we completed all uh, six chapters today before we open the floor I just wanted to summarize so for all the six chapters I found mainly insignificant differences many of those was just to do with the word uh, in Hebrew uh, that word means grain g-r-a-i-n grain and somehow I don't know why the Septuagint decided that it's corn <laughs> Corn didn't even exist in Israel at the time. So I don't even think it's the Septuagint. It's the English translation right. of the Septuagint, which is probably in alignment with King James that also used the word corn. But So I just want you to know there was no corn in Israel at the time. But even nowadays, it's not such a big crop in Israel. Wheat and barley are the crops. So anyway, it was Ukraine, but that was the main thing. But it's really minor, very minor differences between the Septuagint and the Masoretic and the Dead Sea Scrolls. Okay, so you want to close? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Father, and all that you give and provide for our understanding and wisdom. Father, may this study and the research and our opinions may they be a blessing to others as they do their own research and studies and father we pray that each and every person out there will be obedient will love their neighbor will love you sincerely so that they too will be part of the remnant we ask this in yeshua's name amen amen